Hello, David. How are you? I am finally doing well. Can you believe it's already been five years since we parted ways? It's strange. It feels as if no time has passed, and yet so much has already changed about myself. It's been a long journey, and there are some nights I feel like my progress has been halted. Like I'm hitting a brick wall. But then I remember the promise we made to each other. No matter what, we keep moving forward without any regrets. I'm much happier than I've been in a long while, but there are still days I miss you, and the simplicity we shared back then. I feel a bit awkward writing to you after all this time, but I have some things to say, and you're the only person that I want to share them with. I have often wondered how anime enthusiasts keep up with the flood of seasonal releases each year. I've seen so many people who are easily able to go through dozens of series in a three-month period and still have time to go back and watch older series. Personally though, I don't have time to watch many seasonal releases. Between my normal job, prepping videos for YouTube, being a host on Linkara's streams, recording Let's Plays, cleaning around the apartment, and dealing with the antics of my very rambunctious talking cats, I have very little free time. However, when all my work is done and I'm not playing video games, my friends and I sit down to watch a few anime. Of the shows that we watch together, half of them are from my review queue, so we can discuss the shows in detail and I can get a second opinion on the series from people that I trust. With that being said, I usually limit myself to around 15 series a year the majority for review, and the rest just for fun. That way, I can get a decent amount of reviews scripted, and still watch some of the newer releases. To be honest though, even that amount gets tough at times. I often fall behind in Food Wars and My Hero Academia, simply because of scheduling conflicts, or my desire to watch an older anime for a change. This is why I don't review too many seasonal anime. Most of the time, I put seasonal anime on the back burner and wait until it comes out on Blu-ray so I can buy it and watch it at my leisure. As a result, my videos tend to focus on a mix of classic anime and blind recommendations from fans and friends. Well, that and recreations of anime reviews from my old channel. Since last time we took a second look at Assassination Classroom, I wanted to focus on something I haven't covered yet. With that in mind, today I turn to yet another fan recommendation that I've been meaning to review for quite some time, Blood Blockade Battlefront. I first heard of the anime way back in 2016 at Anime Boston of all places. I had been a guest on Dub Talk a couple of times back in 2015, so the Dub Talk group asked me to room with them that year at AB. That year, Lilac and I traveled together to meet up with many of the crew for the first time. We drove over to the airport where Megan, Gigi, and Patrick all piled into my small clown car and made the journey over to the hotel. There wasn't enough room in my trunk for all of our luggage, so they had to carry their suitcases on each other's laps. Completely cramped, we then proceeded to blast anime music in my car as our massive group transformed and rolled out. We were five complete weebs belting fighting dreamers at the top of our lungs, and it was simply fantastic. Afterwards, our group met up with Professor Otaku and Arkata, who were also staying in our room that year, and we proceeded to have the best con experiences of our lives. From that point forward, we created Team Bad Decisions, a group of friends that met up at Anime Boston every year to spend most of our money on anime. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to return to Anime Boston in recent years due to a number of different factors, but this is where I met a lot of my friends in the Anatuber community. I officially became a member of Dub Talk, and where I bought 
the grand majority of my anime collection. Team Bad Decisions introduced me to a lot of things, but the first was Blood Blockade Battlefront. Megan played the opening theme song of BBB in the car on the way there, so I asked her about it, and she said it was a really amazing show. Lilac later confirmed this, so later that year at Yomacon, I bought season one of the anime and placed it into my ever-growing anime collection. With all of this being said, I have to sincerely thank everyone at Team Bad Decisions for a few things. Thank you so much for reigniting my love of anime. At the time, I had been away from anime for a very long period of time, and I wasn't planning on doing any reviews aside from History of One Piece since that was doing really well with my fan base. After meeting up with all these lovable dorks, my creative spark ignited and I wanted to start creating anime reviews again and watch series I hadn't seen before. Ever since this convention, I've been back into anime again full force and have tried my best to get my anime reviews back up and running. Granted, it took me a while because of the new channel and creating the Bun Squad, but I am finally back to a reasonable schedule with all of my series. But more than that, more than introducing me to Arcada and Prof, who are some of my best friends and who are really good people, more than reigniting my creative spark and my love for anime, I am extremely thankful that you wonderful people introduced me to Blood Blockade Battlefront because it is one of my favorite anime of all time. It is legitimately amazing, and I can't wait to delve further into the series with you guys. Put your game faces on, strap on your anime protagonist goggles, and grab a vial of your own blood, because today we are taking a very close look at the first season of Blood Blockade Battlefront. Let's dive in. The Alter World, an alternate dimension running parallel to our own. Therein lies countless monsters, demons, and all number of supernatural creatures. One day, a door to this dimension was opened, directly above New York City, connecting the two worlds for the first time, and allowing the otherworldly inhabitants to spill over into our own. Since that day, a cloud of thick fog has enveloped the city, and the center was transformed into a maze of crisscrossing pathways that defy physics as they lead into this new world. New York City was renamed to Hell Salem's Lot and became a chaotic hub for the weird and unexplained. The abnormal became the norm, and just walking down the street became a battle against the odds of survival. At the center of all this chaos, is a young boy named Leonardo Watch, an aspiring photojournalist who received a powerful gift from the city. One day, Leonardo and his family traveled to the outskirts of Hell Salem's Lot. His parents claimed this was just a normal vacation, but Leonardo knew the truth. They were hoping for a miracle to cure his disabled sister, which were said to occur around the city. Instead, a gigantic monster with hundreds of eyes appeared and offered them a choice. One of them would lose their eyesight, while the other would gain the all-seeing eyes of the gods. Leonardo froze, too afraid to even speak, but his sister Michela called for the creature to take her eyesight if it must do so. Now in possession of the all-seeing eyes, Leonardo moved to Hell Salem's lot to track down Libra, 
a top-secret organization who hunt supernatural criminals using blood magic and bring them to justice. After a while, he manages to locate one of their operatives through a seemingly random string of events and meets with their leader, Klaus von Reinhardt. Leonardo breaks down and begs for his help to not only understand his new powers, but possibly find a way to restore his sister's sight as well. Klaus agrees, and thus Leonardo joins Libra as they fight the denizens of the supernatural and witness the true depths of wonder and depravity contained within Hell Salem's lot. Now, this might seem a bit overwhelming at first, since this is all disclosed to the viewer in the very first episode, but the key element here is the presentation itself. The story begins in Medius Res, as Leonardo races through the city, and as he does so, we're shown news coverage detailing the origin of Hell Salem's lot. We then flash back to earlier that day to learn further details about the city and about Libra, only to flash back again to learn how he received the all-seeing eyes. It is very fast-paced and dumps a lot of information on the viewer at once, but it's always engaging, and after this point, it slows down to let viewers catch a breather and enjoy the craziness of the city itself. And that, to me, is the true brilliance of Blood Blockade Battlefront. Not only do you have this amazing premise full of story possibilities, but you have a setting with personality and wonder. New York City already oozes character on its own, but you add the alter world into the mix and anything is possible. Werewolves, vampires, angels and demons, espers, living blood parasites, elder gods, eldritch abominations, ancient beings of unknown power, and demon trains. These are just a handful of the concepts introduced in Season 1 alone. Blood Blockade Battlefront Season 1 contains 12 individual episodes that can be broken down into two different categories, world building episodes and character development episodes. During the world building episodes, we're introduced to new characters, concepts, and locations for the show to explore, while the character episodes tend to focus on one location with one specific character. For example, the second episode introduces us to illusion magic that demons can use to disguise human trafficking, while episode 3 focuses on Klaus playing a board game against a demon. The show is episodic, which allows you to view each episode without having to worry too much about the ongoing plot. At the same time though, every episode has subtle moments near the beginning and the end that hint towards the true villains of the show, the 13 kings of the Alter World. Thus far, we've only been introduced to Femt, the king of depravity, Aligula, queen of monomania, and the anime-only king of despair. These plot points begin to converge near the second half of the show, leading to an amazing two-part season finale that is just plain awesome. I don't want to give away too much, but it is incredibly inspiring and has me extremely excited for Season 2. What I truly appreciate about Season 1, though, is the pacing. These 12 episodes strike a wonderful balance between an overarching story and standalone events. Like I said before, there are plot points being woven behind the scenes of even the early episodes, but it takes its time to focus on the main characters and what Libra is all about. After joining Libra, Leonardo is taking on numerous different missions to take out Alter World criminals. He helps the organization take on several large threats throughout the season, but the anime also takes time away from larger threats to allow us the chance to really breathe. For instance, Episode 6 focuses on Leonardo making friends with an injured mushroom creature who is struck by a car and bonds with him over burgers. The events in this episode focus on their relationship and what happens when two normal humans in the city attempt to kidnap and extort Leonardo and his new friend. It deals with prejudice and bigotry, 
and overall just hits me hard in the feels every time I see it. I personally feel that this episode, entitled Don't Forget to Don't Forget Me, is one of the best standalone episodes in anime history. The attention that BBB pays to characterization and subtle storytelling really pays off and in this way, the episodic structure serves to give us more insight into the main cast of characters and what makes them tick. Speaking of characters, this cast is one of the strongest I've seen in quite a long time. Libra is an organization filled to the brim with eccentrics and oddballs with noble aspirations but tons of flaws. There are dozens of main operatives that work within Libra, but each one of them is so well defined that they all stand apart from one another. For starters, there's Klaus von Reinhardt, a beast of a man with the cadence of a gentleman whose blood techniques transform into the worst fears of his opponents. He has power and vitality in spades and uses this strength to run Libra to the best of his ability. At the same time, he loves board games immensely, especially an alter world game known as Prosphere. During episode 3, Klaus plays a game of Prosphere against a demon mafia boss of the alter world, Don Arlalel, in order to get information on a drug that's been running rampant on the streets of New York. In addition to this, He's planning to save the life of another grand chess master named Ulchenko, who had lost against the Don earlier in the episode. Klaus is forced to last 99 hours against the Don in order to save Ulchenko's life, which he accepts without hesitation. During the game, we see Klaus's true colors. He has some amazing stamina and just barely manages to last the 99 hours by forfeiting the match at the last second, but the true brilliance is his speech near the end of the game. He is told point blank by the Don that Ulchenko asked to have Klaus killed, but Klaus simply responds with an epic speech that remains one of the highlights of the show. This episode single-handedly made Klaus my favorite character between this speech and the way he sacrifices himself for others who may not even care for him. He truly is a noble badass in every sense of the word, and just seeing him on screen is just awe-inspiring. In addition to Klaus, there's Zap Renfro, a hot-headed womanizing punk who can turn his bloods into blades and thread, Chain Sumeragi, an invisible werewolf who can phase through walls and defy gravity, and Steven Starface, a laid-back, suave businessman who can decrease the temperature of his blood and use it to freeze his opponents. And that's not even getting into the other members like Lucky Abrams, KK, and Zed. Finally, at the center of this chaotic group is Leonardo Watch, who uses his all-seeing eyes to find threats that nobody else can see. Libra is an organization full of people with amazing abilities but Leonardo considers himself normal. Sure, he has all-powerful eyes, but he suffers from a case of depression, believing his self-proclaimed cowardice to be the cause of his sister's blindness. He blames himself for his inability to act, especially since his sister was already in a wheelchair and now she can't even see the letters he writes to cheer her up. While the rest of Libra are fun characters to watch in action, I personally find the true star of the show to be Leonardo in his struggle to forgive himself. Leonardo starts to change over the course of the series as he meets new friends and realizes that there are still things worth living and fighting for. Libra gives him newfound confidence to fight against the evils of the world, and by the end of the season, he not only gains the strength to continue onward, but to help others struggling with the same level of depression that he himself deals with. It's an extremely powerful character arc, and one that many people can relate to, myself included. You see, I also struggle with depression, which I began to see signs of early on in my life. I would have no energy to do things 
that I love doing at random periods of the day and I would have trouble getting out of bed in the morning. There was one point in 2012 where I was in between jobs and I just couldn't muster any energy to go looking for a new one. I didn't want to write or play video games or make anime reviews. I, I just wanted to sleep. I didn't see the point in even trying because I had no drive, no confidence in myself, nothing to keep me going. It took my friends and everything I had inside of me to fight against this and continue living my life normally again. While I still suffer from depression, the people in my life helped me out of my worst moments and showed me that I did indeed have a purpose and that it is worth it to keep fighting against the despair every single day. And to them, my ability to fight day after day is an inspiration. They showed me that my life meant something to other people. This is what Leonardo goes through in Blood Blockade Battlefront. He blames himself every time things go wrong, but thanks to his friends, he gradually realizes that he's important and that's an incredibly inspiring thing to see. During the season finale, Leonardo has to fight against the King of Despair, who has one of his friends held hostage, while Femt and Aligula help him bring about the second collapse of Hell Salem's Lot. The first collapse three years ago destroyed countless lives and created the portal between the human world and the Alter world, completely decimating the center of New York City. A second collapse would be enough to destroy what's left and allow the kings of the Alter world to finally take over. Everything finally comes together as Leonardo musters the courage to take on these powerful opponents and the strength to believe in himself and the future of humanity. It is a simply inspirational conclusion to his arc as he uses his newfound self-love to bring his friend out of her depression and overcome despair itself. Now, I've been particularly vague about the details of this underlying plot thread for one simple reason. I don't want to spoil the experience for any of you. Normally in these reviews, I tend to include spoiler sections because I have to spoil portions of the plot in order to discuss how events affect the characters, but in this case, I feel you need to experience the overarching story for yourself to feel the full impact of all the twists and the revelations and the declarations throughout this final part of the season. I'll delve into these revelations when I review season two, but for now, I just want you to experience it for yourself. All I will say for now is that the season ends on a bittersweet note with hope for the future of Libra and Hell Salem's Lot. Overall, the story of Blood Blockade Battlefront is something completely different compared to the surplus of anime releases that I've seen these days. The viewer is assaulted by a lot of strange and unexplained events, and it can be easy to get lost in just how odd Hell Salem's Lot can be. Yet, this is what drew me to the show. For some, the chaotic nature of the plot and the seemingly random string of events in early episodes will be a massive point of contention. I feel this is down to the plot structure, which is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, we are given a lot of time to breathe and get a feel for the city and what Libra is all about, but on the other hand, we spend a lot of time in the dark speculating about what the story bits really mean. I feel that some people may get fed up with the cryptic nature of the show, but I personally like the direction that the story went in. It may be a bit too experimental for some, which is something that I know Philip had a hard time with, but I really like the plot structure and all of the risks that this anime takes. Honestly, it reminds me a lot of Bakano given its unique approach to storytelling, and I think that's a good thing. 
It also feels a bit like a mix between Cowboy Bebop with its episodic structure and Big O with how crazy that show got at times. It's different to say the least, but I really do think more anime need to take risks like this because it can lead to something truly amazing, and in this case, I think it paid off. In terms of characters, Blood Blockade Battlefront creates another double-edged sword. While the personalities of these characters are well-defined for the most part, we don't really learn much about any of these characters. We are presented with the actions of these characters and are allowed to get a feel for who they truly are, but aside from Leonardo and the two characters tied to the ongoing storyline, we aren't given much to go off of. Through his actions, we can see Zap is a major asshole, but we also get the idea that he wants to be a good person despite his rampant dickery. We can see that Klaus is a noble badass through the way he conducts himself, even though he has a tendency to get completely absorbed in his work to the point that he ignores everything around him. We can see that Lucky Abrams is a wonderful mentor figure to Klaus through their interaction, although he tends to be a bit clueless and overly dramatic at times. In this sense, these characters feel a lot more fleshed out than they actually are because they've shown us their personalities and that they have history with one another. However, we don't actually learn this history in this season. When I showed Blood Blockade Battlefront to Kat from the Disney debate, she was rather put off by the series because of the chaotic structure of the plot and the fact that we really don't know these characters. I have to admit, while I do enjoy the way this anime presents these characters, it won't be enough for some people. There will be viewers who wish to know more about these characters in order to become more attached to them, and that is perfectly valid. I don't know if the second season dives into the backstories about any of these characters, because I haven't seen that season yet, but if you're just watching this season, all you get from the beginning is Leonardo's history, and that might not be enough given how large this cast of characters is. With that being said though, I personally didn't mind this particular issue. I was a bit iffy on the series when I saw the first episode, but it was the actions of the characters in episodes 2 and 3 that made me fall in love with the show, and the ending of the show that cemented my love for this cast of characters. Klaus's drive to save other people was simply infectious to me. Zap's dickery was hilarious in my opinion, and the banter between every member of Libra just sold me on this cast. Yes, we don't know enough about these people yet, but I still find myself cheering them all on and laughing as they fought amongst themselves. They all possess enough defining traits that make them stand out far more than any other anime that I've seen in the past few years. Love or hate this manner of characterization, I still feel that this cast is wonderful and I look forward to seeing more of them in Season 2. In terms of presentation, Blood Blockade Battlefront is second to none. This series was animated by Studio Bones, which is one of the best in the business. Bones has animated numerous top tier anime over the years, including both Full Metal Alchemist series, Soul Eater, Wolf's Reign, Oran High School Host Club, and My Hero Academia, just to name a few. They have a track record for animating some of the most popular anime of the last few decades, although they do have a nasty habit of adapting a manga before it's finished, leading to them needing to make up an anime original ending. I'll save my thoughts on this practice for when we get around to discussing these particular series, but for now, this isn't an issue with Blood Blockade Battlefront, as the show does have a second season that adapts the manga up to the end of its first run. However, we do have a rather strange instance where the larger ongoing plot of Season 1 is anime only. The King of Despair was never in the manga 
in addition to the two characters that he tries to manipulate throughout the series. However, the way they weave the anime-only plotline into the story is simply top-notch in this case. Everything feels like it belongs to the series. I wasn't even aware that the King of Despair and his plans were anime only until Megan from Dub Talk pointed this out to me, and even then, it's hard to tell where the anime stuff ends and the manga begins. I may get around to reviewing the manga to see how well it was adapted, but from what I see here, it came out wonderfully. In terms of the animation itself, Bones once again knocks it out of the park. This is some of the best animation I have ever seen, and I'm not just talking about the fight scenes, which are still very badass. The characters are incredibly expressive, showing a wide array of movements and emotions from just their faces alone. The lighting, shading, and color used in every single scene is carefully chosen to bring across the proper mood and tone, leaving the viewer with a greater appreciation for the more serious moments of the series. However, the true brilliance of this animation exists in the subtle details. The editing in particular is fantastic, cutting together static shots with perspective shots from villains, sweeping pans, and other such transitions that do an excellent job of keeping the viewer engaged. The way the animators play around with perspective is quite interesting as well, given the nature of the Alter World. There are several shots in Episode 3 where we see cars traveling upside down and buildings facing in every direction to show how physics are being warped around the portal to Alter World. The fight scenes are also quite wonderful, as to be expected from Bones. Even though everything is always so fast-paced, you can easily decipher what's going on for every step of the action, and damn, is it smooth. It's a visual marvel, and hard to look away, even when people aren't punching each other in the face, which is the mark of perfect visual design. As for the music, this is another area that BBB excels in. Since the series takes place in New York City, the soundtrack is full of songs playing on the radio throughout the city. It is a melting pot of different sounds from jazz, big band, haunting classical pieces, remixes of popular songs like What a Wonderful World, and plenty of other soul-warming songs. The placement of each song may seem rather strange at first, such as the classical piece used during Klaus's game of Prosphere, but they serve to accentuate how normal and abnormal Hell Salem's Lot really is. There is a sense of normalcy to the abnormal world when familiar songs play, and a sense of the strange and mystical whenever we witness events in the Alter World. I honestly want the full soundtrack for Blood Blockade Battlefront, given just how diverse this music is, and that cover of What a Wonderful World is really good. Of particular note is the opening theme song for the series, Hello World by Bump of Chicken. This theme is simply one of the best I have ever seen in an anime. Every time I hear this song, I get chills. It's honestly hard to explain what makes it so special to me, but from the moment I hear the opening lyrics to the song, I get inspired to create. The lead singer's voice is simply haunting, and the more I hear it, the more restless I feel to the point that I start working on projects simply because of it. The song pumps me up from the very beginning to the very end, which is the mark of a fantastic theme song in my book. However, it's not just the song that I love. The animation itself is layered with subtle nods to the characters and their relationships. For instance, there's a point where we cut to Leonardo's sister in a beautiful field 
full of color. Immediately afterwards, we transition to Leonardo, who is surrounded by a world devoid of color until he opens his eyes. The more he opens his eyes, the more dots of color appear, and once his eyes open fully, his world is lit up once again, and the camera pans around as the various members of Libra add more color to his world with their abilities. This tells us that Leo's world is dark because he blames himself for his sister's blindness, but when he opens his eyes to the people around him, he begins to see that there is hope and color in the world after all. This is just one of the many layers woven into the opening theme song, and the more I watch the opening, the more things I see. It is a complex theme that is both melancholy and inspiring, showing the darkness of the world while also giving us hope for the main character as he heads toward the light at the end of the opening theme song. It is frankly one of the best openings I have ever seen and definitely in my top 10 for sure. And then there's the ending theme, Sugar Song and Bitter Step, which is possibly even better. It combines a jazzy, happy-go-lucky tune with the entire cast dancing to create one of the most memorable ending themes in recent memory. It showcases the beauty of the world of Blood Blockade Battlefront while still showing snippets of Leonardo's despair when his sister lost her eyes. I find the best ending themes are incredibly catchy and easy to sing along to, but an added plus is reminding us of the plight of the main character while this is happening. To be perfectly honest, I think Sugar Song and Bitter Step is even better than Mina No Peace and Hello Shooting Star. It is right up in my top 10 ending themes simply by being a fantastic song that is fun to dance to, but it also has a ton of meaning behind it and I just can't get enough. In terms of voice acting, the Japanese sub is just okay. It's not bad, but I felt as if the voice actors were too one note for the characters. There is not enough inflection to their voices, and even after a few episodes, it just doesn't seem to improve. It's a shame too, because Kazuya Nakai is cast as Zap Renfro, and this is the one role I just don't like him in. Normally, I love him as Zoro in One Piece, but here he adopts an accent and a cadence that just feel out of place. Also, Miyamoto Mitsuru is just plain bad as Steven Starface. He gives a performance so dull and lifeless, it makes Jun Kazu in Kamen Rider Double seem interesting by comparison. I don't think the sub is bad per se, but it is extremely miscast. So I guess it's a good thing that the dub blows it out of the water completely. Perhaps it's because this takes place in New York, where people have all types of accents and dialects, or perhaps it's the style of the series. Once again, I have to make a comparison to Bacano. Bacano takes place in prominent American locations, and the dub feels more natural simply because of the specific accents added to the cast. It's the same situation here, where the English feels much more natural to the setting, but even more than that, the cast just works so much better than the Japanese counterpart. Leonardo Watch is voiced by Aaron Dismuke, who previously voiced Alphonse Elric in Full Metal Alchemist, one of my favorite anime of all time. I feel he really gets across the anxiety, awkwardness, and depression of Leonardo in every single scene he's in, and I love how he handled Leonardo's arc over the course of the series. Other notable VAs in the dub include Micah Solasad as the King of Despair, Phil Parsons as Klaus von Reinhardt's, Ian Sinclair as Zap Renfro, and J. Michael Tatum as Steven Starface. This is just a small handful of the talent pool 
that Funimation brought to the table for BBB. Hell, Justin Cook and Chris Sabat make brief appearances in two different episodes, and they're as good as ever. The big standouts for me, though, were Stephanie Young as KK, Mark Stoddard as Lucky Abrams, Tia Ballard as Aligula, and Josh Greeley as Femt. All four of these casting decisions were perfect, and they all feel like they were born to play these characters. In my opinion, this stands out as one of the best dubs I've ever heard, and I would personally take it over the sub any day of the week. The only time I found it necessary to turn on subtitles was during the lore explanations. For some reason, those aren't translated in the dub, and I can't for the life of me figure out why. It's easy to quickly turn on subtitles for those sections, but it's the same problem some films have where they don't put in subtitles during a brief section of foreign dialogue. On top of that, when I was watching the Japanese track, the subtitles were incredibly stiff. They felt like they were directly translated instead of the translation the dub itself received. I normally have a subtitle track turned on when available, so I don't miss any bits of dialogue or mishear what they're saying because of an accent, but it was completely different than what was actually being said and hard to read because of it. Another thing that I noticed was that there were several musical changes to the Japanese track, including the removal of Hello World when Leonardo finds the bug in episode 1. This is the most epic moment of that episode in the dub, but the sub completely negates the atmosphere by not having any music during that pivotal moment. I'm not sure if this was an error for the Blu-ray or not, but it really took me out of the moment when I was expecting the opening theme to start playing. In terms of extras, there's some present on the Blu-ray, but not too much. You have two behind-the-scenes interviews with voice actors stating their thoughts on the characters and the series as a whole, but these are short and are the only major thing on the disc. Other than that, you have standard stuff, like trailers for other anime, textless openings and endings, and other promotional videos, but nothing to really write home about. There's not even a commentary track, which many other Blu-ray releases contain. This is one of the more bare-bones releases that I've seen in a few years, which is rather unfortunate because it means that I can't recommend purchasing the Blu-ray as much as I normally do. Overall, I personally really love Blood Blockade Battlefront. It has fantastic presentation, offering some of the best animation in the business that isn't just centered around the combat of the show, an incredibly diverse selection of musical tracks, kick-ass opening and ending themes, and an English dub that is simply perfect. While the experimental structure of the plot and the lack of information on these characters may turn some people off to the series, I personally view them as strengths that help Blood Blockade Battlefront stand apart from other series that were premiering at the time. I consider Blood Blockade Battlefront Season 1 an anime that everybody should watch at least once in their lives, and one that deserves a spot in your collection regardless of the score that I'm going to give. I personally give Blood Blockade Battlefront a Kana stamp of approval plus. It may not be everyone's cup of tea, and it does have a few problems here and there, but it's one of my top series of 2015 for a reason. It outranks Assassination Classroom Season 1 and Food Wars Season 1 in terms of quality, and thus far only One Punch Man ranks higher in my eyes when comparing the anime series of 2015. God, 2015 was a great year for anime. So kudos to Blood Blockade Battlefront, a wonderful series that helped me through my own depression and allowed me to see the light beyond the darkness in my own life. Give it a watch. I don't think you'll be disappointed. Blood Blockade Battlefront Season 1 
is licensed by Funimation and can be purchased either directly through Funimation or over on RightStuff.com. When I first bought Season 1 back in 2016, it retailed for $56, but as of this writing, it'll only cost you $38, which is a very good price for something this awesome. Right Stuff is a fantastic option if you want a physical release, but if you prefer digital releases, Funimation is streaming the entire series on their Funimation Now streaming service. For just $5.99 a month, you can watch the entirety of Blood Blockade Battlefront, including the second season, Blood Blockade Battlefront and beyond. And just remember my friends, as long as you're taking even one step toward the light, no matter the struggle, your spirit can never be broken. With all of that being said, I'm Zenith Warrior Princess, the cutest of buns, and I will see you all next time. If you like what you see, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe so that you too can join the Bun Squad, my legion of cute fluffy bunnies that enjoy my videos. And hey, while you're here, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Special thanks to James Bevan and 7 Seraphim 7 for supporting the channel already. Just a reminder that if you donate $20, you'll have a chance to request a movie, game, TV show, or anime of your choosing, within reason, for me to review on the Bun Squad. The number of people who can pledge for this reward is limited though, so if you're interested, donate while you still can. Oh, and special announcement time! If you pledge just one dollar, you'll have a chance to vote on the order of the three videos following the next one. If one of these three reviews interests you, please consider pledging in order to vote. Voting will be open until March 19th, which is when the next video is scheduled to be released, although depending on other factors, it may change, but that's when we're hoping to get the episode out. And as always, don't forget to hit that bell so that you can get notified of every new video. Have a good one, everybody! Things are far more complicated now. I've managed to muddle through the best and worst days of my life, but I know I could never go back to the way things were before, because I'm driven forward by the energy you left me. Before I left you behind, I saw myself as worthless, someone who was insignificant to the grand scheme of the world, just another powerless, idealistic little person that you could find on any street in any city. My feelings haven't changed much since then, but every now and then, I get a faint glimmer that these feelings aren't true. And today, I want to tell you all the reasons I've begun to think differently. I want to talk about what I've seen, what I've felt, and above all else, about the people I've met on my journey. This might turn out to be a long letter, but I hope you'll bear with me and read it to the end. Who's there? Okay, enough's enough. Don't think I haven't been suspicious of things around here. I know Philip and Kana didn't cause that blackout back in the Halloween review, and I can't have been the only person affected by it just by chance, so show yourself before I activate my own abilities. I don't know who you are, but if you think just looming there menacingly like you have before is going to spook me this time, then you've got enough- <laughs> Well, well, Zenith. I think it's time we test just how much of this you can stomach. I hope you are stronger than you appear. At the same time, your past has indeed caught up to you. It is time to count up your sins. Because in your case especially... We're going to be here for a while. No, 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 no,
I'm not a fool. 